So cancer is an evolutionary process. There are accumulations of mutations, and then there is selection for mutations that make cells more malignant, more like cancer cells. So mutations come at random. So all genes in all positions in the genome can be mutated. Different positions can be more mutated, others less mutated. But mutations ha can happen anywhere, and then that can make cells more sick, sort of less fit. Or it can make cells more fit and give them some advantage over their neighbors, so they will start proliferating and growing and building the body of, of a cancer. We know that there are several classes of genes that need to be mutated for cancer to progress. These are tumor suppressors, genes that protect our cells from cancer, so they need to be inactivated by mutations. And oncogenes, these genes need to be overactivated by mutations, but again, these are just mutations, just changes in, the, in, in DNA. Or, for example, amplification. So the same gene, it's not mutated, but now instead of one copy of this gene, you get 10 copies of this gene. And that's enough to make the cell a um, cancer cell. But mutations cannot really hit at specific positions. That's the essence of Darwinian theory of evolution, is that mutations happen at random. So that means that cells are sitting and waiting for the next mutation. And now we're talking about cancer. So cancer cells are sitting and waiting for the next mutation to happen. When this mutation happens in one of the cells, this cell will take over the population and will form sort of a new, new layer of cancer, if you wish. However, the cells are sitting and waiting for the right mutation, so they're getting random mutations. And they're generally getting a little bit sick from these random mutations. Uh, and these mutations are collectively called passengers. So those mutations that drive cancer progression are called drivers, uh, and, pa and, and others are called passengers. So it's generally believed that passengers are neutral. They play no role in cancer. Because drivers are all are usually the same in different patients, but passengers are all different. So in every patient, passengers are going to be different from passenger mutations in another patient. So why bother? We can't really use them for any therapeutics. That's how people usually think about passengers. However, passengers may not necessarily be neutral. Generally, if you have mutations, mutations usually make cells less fit, make them sort of sick. So what my group is interested in is trying to understand whether passenger mutations may actually be damaging to cancer. Nevertheless, by virtue of cancer sitting waiting for the next driver, and drivers sort of playing the main role in this process, damaging, can, damaging passengers can sort of hitchhike on the driver. And hitchhike is not only a metaphorical word here, but it's actually the name of the genetic process in which mutations that are not responsible for a specific phenotype can nevertheless sort of propagate jointly with some mutations that, that lead to a phenotype. In this case, so cancers, cancers would stay, so cancer cells would accumulate sort of passenger mutations, uh, which might be somewhat damaging, and then one of them would get the right driver mutation and found a new population carrying all the baggage of, of damaging drivers with it. So people have been analyzing sort of cancer genomics data. And when you go and sequence a, a cancer and compare a sequence of a cancer cell from a patient with the sequence of a normal tissue from the same patient, you can see tens of thousands of mutations specific to cancer. Only five or 10 of those are driver mutations. We know this because we know that these mutations affect genes known for cancer progression. And we know this because if I were to go and compare different patients, I would see only five or 10 genes recurrently affected. All other genes are going to be affected at random. So 10 mutations are drivers, but other ten of this, tens of thousands are passengers. So we hypothesize that passengers may actually be deleterious, or some of them. To test this, we actually built computer simulations where, we, where cells stochastically divide, uh, die, accumulate mutations, driver mutations that give them advantage, and passenger mutations, which might be mildly deleterious, slightly damaging. And the question that we ask is whether those damaging mutations can make it to the final simulated tumor. And to our great surprise, we found that indeed hundreds or, or thousands of passenger mutations that are mildly damaging 
can nevertheless make it to the final tumor. We say, okay, that's just a model. It shows that the idea is feasible, that it's feasible that cancers accumulate damaging mutations. Can we now actually test this by looking at cancer genomics data? So we went uh, into big databases of, of, cancer genomic, of cancer genomics, looked specifically at those passenger mutations that nobody analyzed. People usually look for drivers and then discard passengers. So we looked specifically at those discarded passengers, say, do these mutations look like neutral or do they look like damaging? How do we know this without doing experiments? There is a way, uh, and the approach is based on comparative genomics. If I look at a specific mutation, and I see that this particular amino acid in a protein has been conserved for the last 300 million years, it's been always this specific amino acid. That presumably means that this amino acid needs to be this one. And if I were to go and change it, it would make the organism sick. However, there are some amino acids that are changing all the time. And so if I go and change it, presumably it, such mutation would have little effect. So we use these tools of comparative genomics to analyze cancer data. And what we've seen is that passenger mutations look like they are hidden everywhere, even in those regions where no mutations were allowed in, evolu in natural evolution. So, so cancer genomics uh, data essentially tells us that passenger mutations that people have largely ignored in their analysis seem to be damaging to cancer cells. We still need to do experiments to test this. Uh, but this is a very provocative hypothesis because it essentially tells us that we should start thinking about cancer in a very different terms than we used to. The common paradigm of thinking about cancer is that it's a sequence of unfortunate events. First you get this mutation, then you get that mutation, then you get another mutation, and then it's a fully blown uh, sort of clinical cancer. And then a few other mutations and it becomes malignant. Now we start thinking about this as a balance between two classes of mutations. There are, there are driver mutations that sort of drive cancer progression, but there, are, there is an inevitable accumulation of mildly deleterious or damaging passengers. And if there are more passengers, cancer may actually melt down spontaneously. And again, clinically, it's known that small cancers tend to melt down. Large ones are more likely to progress. And there are lots of other clinical phenomena that we can start explaining using this balance between drivers that uh, lead to progression and passengers that can slow down neoplastic progression. Like long periods of dormancy, when cancer stays at one size and may shrink, then grow, shrink and grow. Again, very well characterized clinically and classical theory doesn't really know how to explain this thing because you should get new mutations if, if, um, if it's just a sequence of unfortunate events. Now, we start also thinking of what, what might be therapeutic perspectives for using passenger mutations. Uh, so cancers accumulate lots of mutations that are damaging to them. That makes them different from the rest of the body where you see very few, if any, damaging mutations. So is there any way to exploit this vulnerability of cancer? Our thinking about this uh, led to the hypothesis that uh, cancer should have some mechanisms uh, allowing it to live at high mutation rate. And it may actually be using some of the mechanisms that we used or are used in evolution, in natural evolution, that allow organisms to evolve while buffering effects of random mutations. And it's known that this mechanism generally are responsible for folding mutated proteins. Because the first thing mutations do, they prevent proteins from forming a healthy structure. And there are other special mechanisms in the cell that sort of help these sick proteins to fold. Or if the protein is too sick, it pretty much degrades it. So these mechanisms might be, in fact, important for cancer progression because they allow cancer cells to, to evolve. So we're thinking that drugs that target these mechanisms, mechanisms that make cancer cells more evolvable, may actually be a good sort of new generation of, of drugs. Uh, other things like increasing elevating temperature may actually do the job because when there are more mutations, proteins are less healthy, so higher temperature would make them break down. So, so that's, 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 this is our thinking. Again, it still need to be all tested experimentally. These are only first steps in this direction. But we're generally sort of very optimistic thinking about therapies in cancer that are not trying to kill cancer cells, 
but are trying also to make cancer cells less evolvable. Because evolvability of cancer cells is, in fact, the main killer. No matter what drug you give, the evolvability to, 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 to be resistant to this drug. If we can actually target the sole evolvability of cancer cells, we may actually slow down cancer progression. We still do not fully understand what's the role of passenger mutations. We hypothesize that they're damaging, but we don't know to what extent they're damaging, and this needs to be tested experimentally. Again, we can do sort of genomic analysis and simulations, but sort of experiments on, on cells and small animals will actually tell us this. We would like to see whether the number of mutations is actually uh, prognostic of uh, the course of the disease. Some cancers would have more mutations, some less. So what's the effect of these passenger mutations on the actual uh, progression of the disease? And we would like also to see whether the types of passenger mutations, because there might be several types of passenger mutations, right now we put them all together, so whether types of passenger mutations may actually sort of um, determine phenotype of, of cancer cells. Some mutations would make them look different, some mutations would make the cells more sick, and finally, we'd like to see, to know what are the biological mechanisms that allow cells to evolve while accumulating these bad mutations. We see that there are bad mutations. We see that cancers accumulate them. We don't know how it manages to, to live with this load of, of uh, passenger mutations.